Well, good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church in our online service for this week. We are so glad that you are joining us today. And whether you're watching on Sunday morning or any time throughout the week, we want you to know that we've been praying for you, that this service would help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, because that's what we are all about. And whether you are visiting with us for the first time or first time in a long time, or you have been with us every single week, we are so glad that you are here today. I wanted to begin the service by giving you just two very quick announcements, both about events taking place in May. The first one is on May 1st. We are very excited to be hosting a women's one day retreat, and that will be on campus. And we would love for you to be able to sign up and join us for this special event. Uh, all the safety precautions, of course, will be taken, and you can find out more information about that on our website at www.wpcesco.com. And then the, fo the following day, on May 2nd, we are excited that we will be beginning to have a third service. Now, what does that mean? It means that our first service will always be online, and we will have that available at 9 a.m. or on demand anytime through our website, Facebook, or our Vimeo pages. But in addition to that service, we are going to have two services in person on our campus. The first one will be at 9 a.m. outside, and it will be our contemporary service. Then at 11 a.m., we will have a inside traditional service. And the reason we're doing all three of these in a tier system is so that you can worship in church and worship Christ in the most comfortable way and for where you feel safe. So you can be online, in person, outside, or in person, inside. So if you want to attend any one of those, we look forward to you uh, coming and joining us in whichever service you choose. But for now, let's begin this morning's worship service by singing these songs and focusing our minds and hearts on our Savior, Jesus Christ.
For prayer today, I'm starting with verses from Psalm 111. Please join me in prayer. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He remembers his covenant forever. And we do lift up our hearts today, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise your name. You are holy and perfect, and we are in awe of the wonders of creation, the stars, the universe, the beauty, new life. You provide all we need in this life and for, and for eternity. You bring miracles of new life and transformation. Truly, your works are great. You are faithful and merciful, Lord, even when we are not. We want to praise you with our whole hearts, but we know we are often divided in our hearts. Forgive us when we put other things first in our lives, even good things. Help us, Lord, to put you first. We confess we focus on problems and ourselves more than you. Forgive us for not seeking you and for failing to act with compassion toward others. We confess, Lord, we have neglected to give you credit and thanks for all that we have. Forgive us for keeping your blessings to ourselves instead of sharing. Hear our silent personal confessions. Thank you for hearing us, each one of us, for cleansing us from sin, for making us new. We thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness in your name, the name above all names. You are so gracious and your mercies are new every morning. Great are your works, Lord. Continue molding us into your image and help us to tell others of your good deeds. Lord Jesus, you loved the world so much that you laid down your life. And so we love your world too. We pray for your world, the world you created, the world you love, and for all the people in it. We pray today for unity among your children. Give us grace with one another. Help us to be your body on earth your hands and feet to show your love with our words and our actions. We pray for our country today. We lift up our leaders. We are all lost without you, Jesus. We ask that you would guide our government officials by your strong hand. They need your discernment. Lead them to govern justly. Soften their hearts and all of our hearts to see beyond political and racial divisions, to see one another as you do, Lord. We ask that you would guard the innocent children in danger today. We ask that you would comfort those recovering from loss and trauma. And we ask that you would give courage to the fearful and despairing. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to draw near to you in this community. We pray for those with ties to our church family who serve in our military and ask that you would bless and protect our troops and their families. Be with those who are hurting today, Lord. We lift up prayers for healing, for wholeness from emotional pain and loss for recovery after injury and surgery, for wellness and strength, for all fighting long-term illness and diseases. You know the details, Lord. You know the names and the greatest need. Mighty God, we seek you for our loved ones, that they may know you and seek you too. We ask for your healing. We pray that they would feel your love and strength in the midst of their troubles. In your power and in your time, Lord Jesus, we trust you to bring help and healing and your peace. And we pray together as Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are in week two of our sermon series, which I am calling The Ministry of Presence. And last week, I said that I sometimes am so overwhelmed by everything that is going on in the world. And it isn't just the events. It's also the awareness of all of the events in the world. That along with our 24-hour news cycle, we know about every natural disaster, every international incident, every military tension and conflict, the war on drugs, the war on illegal trafficking. Then there's hunger, thirst, homelessness, 
and it gets so easy to become overwhelmed by everything happening. And many of us who have a compassionate heart, it's just so heartbreaking. And one of the problems is that there is video and pictures and sound for all of these events and issues throughout the world. And it all comes to us at such a fast pace that it's easy to become calloused or numb to it all. And then we also have the personal tragedies that we know about. The struggles in someone's marriage or family, rumors of divorce in someone's family. Then we have our friends or our children, maybe even know people at their school who have gotten cancer or in a bad accident, and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We also hear about families that have prodigal sons or daughters and close friends and families who are struggling and ask, would you come and pray for me? Would you pray for them? Would you come and have a conversation with me or them? And I don't know about you, but at times it gets frustrating to me because I myself sense a numbness or a callousness to it all. But it's also frustrating because I don't really know what I can do about all of it. I mean, the problems are so big and massive, so global. And last week, we remembered this phrase that we've heard a thousand times growing up. And unfortunately, we've, had, we've started saying this as adults. And the phrase that we heard a thousand times was in response to a question or an ask or a request that we had. Can I have this? Can I do that? Can I go early? Can I, can I? And the teacher, the coach, the boss, the parent, they looked at us and said, well, I can't let you do that because if I let you, I'll have to let everyone do it as well. To which our natural response was, no, you don't. I won't tell and you won't tell. But it never really went that way. In fact, it was worse than that. We started to live this way. That if we can't give to everyone, then we won't give at all. And if we can't let everyone go early, well, we won't let anyone go early. And the problem is this way of living, it very, might, it very well might have prevented you from doing anything for anyone. But here's the real issue, is that I'm a Christian and that you are a Christian. And we know that we shouldn't live that way. We know that we shouldn't even think that way and we actually can't live that way. So what are we supposed to do then? Well, last week I introduced a passage from the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In other words, we're going to look at what Jesus did and follow him in the same way. And so last week, in case you missed it or need a refresher, I talked about this phrase that I have started to live by, and I want you to live by it as well. The phrase is simple. It's do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Because we can never do for all, but we can do for one. And so today I wanted to share with you one of the accounts of Jesus who did for one, and that we too should put into practice, going for the one. But before I do, I wanted to tell you about the time that I went to prison. Now, unfortunately, it isn't that exciting. I was invited to go and visit Donovan State Prison down in Otay Mesa with a friend who was doing prison ministry. I'm sure you're disappointed that I didn't actually go. Now, I had never done anything like this before in my life, and I was a little scared, to be honest. And the scariness started when I was told not to wear blue or orange colored shirts and to wear something totally different colored because all of the prisoners wore blue or orange jumpsuits. And if for some reason, like there was a prison riot or a fight or the guards needed to get involved in something, I wouldn't want to be confused with one of the prisoners. So I decided to wear a bright red shirt. Now I had gone through all the administrative processes, like sending in my ID in advance. 
I walked through metal detectors to make sure I didn't have a hidden file in a cake, I guess, or a weapon. I even walked past the drug-sniffing dogs. And then there was one last set of doors that I had to walk through before I was in prison. And the scariest thing happened. The guard handed me a little box that looked like a garage door opener. And I said, what's this? The guard explained that if I pushed the button, that guards would come running with guns drawn and riot shields. Yikes. Now, what the, I, I started to ask, well, what does that mean? You aren't coming with us, Mr. Policeman, Mr. Prison Guard? Nope, they're not. So armed with a Bible and a garage door button, my friend and I walked into the prison yards and to towards the chapel. Now I tried to play it cool and look maybe even kind of tough, but when I turned the last corner, I almost chickened out and ran the other direction. Because walking out of one of the doors were the toughest, scariest, meanest looking hardened criminals that I had ever seen. They could have taken turns bench pressing me and then probably eaten me for lunch. They were intimidating. And they walked out of a door and turned right towards us. I was prepared to hand them my wallet, except that I had left my wallet in the car. It was almost too much. A prison yard, guards with guns up in the towers, and all I had was a little plastic garage door button. And in front of me, these terrifying men coming right towards me. And I imagine that the disciples felt like that, and even maybe a little bit more in the story that we're looking at today. And it comes from Mark chapter 5. Well, it starts actually at the end of Mark chapter 4. And what had just happened, to give you some context, was this famous story of the disciples in a boat with Jesus and this furious storm that had come up. And in the midst of all of the rowing, bailing water, and yelling from these professional fishermen, Jesus was in the front of the boat asleep. And then Jesus is woken up and he calms the storm. But the important detail that I want you to know about is what Mark records in verse 35. He said that it was evening when they first got into the boat. And so at night, the disciples and Jesus sailed to a town on the other side of the lake. And I don't know about you, but this sounds terrifying. Being out in the lake in the darkness. And so Mark chapter 5, it says, They went across the lake to the region of Gerasene. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Remember, it's night, and when they get out of this boat, here comes this man running down to meet Jesus and the disciples. Now Mark describes the man this way. This man lived alone in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. I mean, that's terrifying. And I'm sure the disciples were like, Jesus, let's get back in the boat and get out of here. But Jesus doesn't because Jesus is there to conduct some business. So when he saw Jesus from a distance, this man, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And I love that part, that the, all, you have all the disciples and all these other people, the religious leaders, all trying to figure out who Jesus is. And in the midst of a scary, graveyard-like feel with tombs, this man with an unclean spirit, demon-possessed, I'm not really sure, but he certainly knows who he is dealing with. In God's name, he says, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Okay, the scary factor here just keeps increasing. 
If there was a soundtrack, the scary horror movie music would be playing at this point. The palms of the disciples' hands are probably sweating, the hair on the back of their neck standing up, this awful fear. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send the demons out of the area. Now this next part is kind of strange, and you might have heard this before, but Jesus ends up casting out these demons into a herd of pigs. And then the pigs do the most extraordinary and unexpected thing. They run down into the water and all drown. Now the pig farmers run off to tell the town. Now most likely the whole town had part ownership of this pig herd and it was probably a huge source of income for the town. And why would a bunch of Jewish men and women own a herd of pigs is a really good question, but for another day. Regardless, the town comes out to see what has happened. But as they approached, they found something that they never expected. When they came to Jesus, the town, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Wait, what? You mean to tell me that they're, they are afraid that this man is sitting there dressed and in his right mind and that they are afraid? I was afraid when he was the man living in the tombs, breaking chains, couldn't be bound, running around the hills at night screaming and probably half naked. That's when I was afraid. But the town, they are afraid now. Interestingly, if this was like any of the other towns, two things probably would have happened. First, they would have invited Jesus into the town to heal the sick, to teach them, and to stay for as many days as you could get Jesus to stay. And the second thing that would happen is there would be a big group of people that would now want to follow Jesus and would go wherever he went. That's kind of how it works from town to town. But this town is different which is why I love the story of what Jesus does. The people, as they came to Jesus, the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And then Mark records in verse 18 that as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. I mean, of course, this is how Jesus operates. He heals and people follow and the crowds grow. He casts out demons and people follow and the crowds and the followers grow and grow and grow. So of course he came up to Jesus and begged to go with him. But then the strangest thing happens. Jesus did not let him. Instead, he says to him, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And this is the part you don't want to miss. Jesus, in the middle of the night, he gets on a boat and he sails towards the town of Gerasenes. And he went for this one man. And then he left. But he went for the one. Not for the town. Not for an increase of the crowd. He went for this one man which is actually what we must do too. Go for the one. And I've told you last week that this is my prayer for you, is that God is going to nudge you, that you are going to see the one friend, that you are going to see the one struggling mom or the one struggling family, that you're going to see that one age group of students that need a leader in our youth group. You're going to see that one age group of kids you're going to see that one neighbor who is struggling or hurting, suffering, or lost. You're going to see that one, and God is going to nudge you. And God is going to say, that is your one. I want you to do for that one what you wish you could do for everyone. And isn't that exactly what Jesus does here? He leaves a massive crowd behind. He goes in the night for the one. And this is one of the most significant miracles that Jesus does, that he shows up 
in the flesh, in the blood. It was his presence. Because Jesus' presence is powerful. In fact, our presence is powerful when we show up. Presence sends a message. And the message isn't, I wholeheartedly agree with you and everything you do. Presence sends a message that says, I care about you. I like you. And that is why I am committed to being around you and with you. Presence, in fact, is actually the number one tool that every pastor should have in their belt. You might not know what to say, but your presence says, I care about you. And that's why we too must follow Jesus and practice the ministry of presence. Now, I want to get to this last part because it's so amazing to me that as Jesus sailed off in the boat from this healed man, he had given him some instructions. Jesus told him, go to your home, go to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And he has had mercy on you. So he went, the man went away and began to tell the, the capitalists, which means the 10 cities. Now it's a grouping of 10 towns, mostly all Greek, which is really important. And so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And it says that all the people in the Decapolis were amazed. And then later on, probably years later, the disciple John records that there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the feast. And these Greeks, they came to Philip, interestingly, a Greek name. And they came with a request, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And so Philip went to Andrew, the other disciple with a Greek name. And they went to Jesus. And there are two really amazing moments here. The first is that one scholar suggests that these Greeks possibly came from the Decapolis, the very place where the healed man went and told everyone about what Jesus had done for him. And it is quite possible that these men who had heard about Jesus were now coming to see Jesus in the flesh and blood. That the presence of Jesus in this man's life spilled over to others more and more and more people's lives were eventually transformed because of the faithfulness of the one that he had gone to and that that one man had shared what Jesus had done for him. The other thing about this that is so important is that those who would seek and to see Jesus must go through the disciples now. That br the bringing of these Grecian men to the knowledge of Christ is done through the disciples. Now, after Easter, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus into heaven, a person gets to Jesus through the testimony of Christ's disciples. In other words, you, you sharing what God has done is how people come to Jesus. And sometimes you'll have to enter into a scary, unknown situation that God has nudged you into. And sometimes you won't know what to say. You won't know what to do. But you need to show up. You need to be present with the one person and share what Jesus has done for you. So I want to finish this story uh, that I started with when I went to prison. In the scariest of moments, walking towards these scary men, I got closer and closer and then my friend introduced me to these group, this group of men, that these men were the worship team. And you know that scratching record sound that means your brain just got completely jolted? Well, that is exactly what happened in my mind because it doesn't matter to God who you were or what you have done. It matters to God who you are and what you do. You know, maybe you remember that old movie, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You know, there's this inventor who finds this old beat up race car and it's become all rusty and damaged. And it's basically junk now and headed for the scrap heap. But this guy, he sees it and he brings it home. He gets all these parts and he starts working on it. And you could say 
he spends time with the car. And the whole time you hear the sound of banging and scraping and welding coming from the garage. And then after a while, he flings open the doors and out comes this amazing, incredible new car. And it isn't just nice, it's better than it was before. It looks cleaner, it's restored, and of course, it doesn't just drive, it can fly. And you know, this is exactly what Jesus did for the demon-possessed man. This is what Jesus did for me. And this is what Jesus did for you, or wants to do for you. But don't miss this. This is what Jesus wants you to do for someone out there. So, who is the one? Who is the one that God is nudging you towards? And it might be in an unknown, scary location. It might be in a difficult time for someone's life. It might be in the midst of a storm or suffering or pain or difficulty. But who is God nudging you towards? Who is that one that God is putting on your heart? A coworker, a neighbor, a family member, someone who needs to experience the ministry of presence through you. I want to encourage you to pray about that and to think about that. And not only that, but to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we were once that one. Lord, that somebody else looked at us and you nudged them. You nudged them to be involved in our life. You nudged them to be present with us. And then, Lord, they began to share with us what you have done through their life. And it impacted us. And now, Lord, just like the Grecian uh, men who came to see you. Lord, there are so many people around us who have that desire in their heart to see you. And Lord, we just ask and pray that you would use us, that you would nudge us, that you would put a name on our hearts and our minds, that it's someone that we need to reach out to and to be present with. And we thank you that you are the one who can heal. You are the one who brings that new life and restores people. We are so grateful for what you have done in our lives and how you will use us to impact others. We give you thanks and pray all this in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.